out on the land, everything we do causes multiple reactions to occur. So the man calls and says, uh, no, Director, uh, we've got mesquite on our land. We want to know what to spray to kill it. I tell them. They contract it out. Guy sprays it. They come back out in the year. They kick the mesquite. They're dead. Job done. And I tell them, wrong. Until you see what comes up to take the place of the mesquite, the action is not through. See, what if you kill the bad plant and a worse bad plant came up? Who said that if you kill brush, good grass will come up? Who said that? They lied. See, what is the truth? But have you ever seen a bad ad? One that says in neon lights, don't buy our product, it doesn't work. Yeah. What do all ads say in neon lights? Oh, we're the best. We're better than X, Y, and Z. And if you don't buy our product, you're going to hell. <laughs> is it really true the Ford is better than the Chevrolet? Chevrolet is better than the Dodge. The Dodge is better than the Toyota. Ladies and gentlemen, they all pass EPA requirements for being driven on the roads of America. They all have the same combustion engine. It is only the whim of man that makes one brand better than another. And I want a 10 CD changer in the dashboard. I want a Landau roof. I want a red car. I want a yellow car. I want carpet. I want vinyl. It has nothing to do with the operation of the car. They are all the same. Now, I'm not talking about the service department <laughs> where you take it in to get it fixed. So, see, think about these principles. These are not great big scientific findings. These are common sense. See, but you've been led astray. <laughs> Principle number four says, humans have found that nature adhors a void and provides plants through the processes of primary and secondary succession, and that means change to fill the openness. So when your dog builds a path in the backyard, you bulldoze the land, you plow the land, you build the garden, and weeds come up, that is absolutely normal. See, if we did not have the weeds in Mother Nature's bailiwick of recovery plants to come up, this whole area of the state would now be a barren desert. See, weeds. Think about the guy that said, I, there's nothing better in life than ice cream. But another guy said, well, a bag of feathers would be better than nothing. Therefore, feathers are better than ice cream. Nothing is better than ice cream. You got it? See, we can play with words and understanding to make it fit anything that we want. See? But we need to know the truth. So the weeds that come up fill the openness because Mother Nature is going to cover the soil with plant material, I don't care what it is, to reduce the impact of a raindrop, slow down erosion, keep the soil cooler. And so in 2001, a guy called me and said, uh, Dr. Rector, i got weeds all in my land. I want, I want to spray and improve it. And I said, sir, what's growing under your weeds? He said, nothing. And I said, the weeds are better than nothing. And I wouldn't tell him what to spray. But the next guy called and said, Dr. Rector, i got weeds on my land. And if I can just get them out of the way from the little bit of rain we're going to get, the grass that's under there will do better. And I told him what to spray. Because, see, he had something to respond to. To the instrument of change. See, if there's nothing down there, then what's there is better than nothing. Principle number five says, humans have found that nature knows best. Organisms that which are suited and adapted to the change occupy the site. That means what's outside this building, what's in your backyard, what's in the alley, the vacant lot, over in another pasture, they're the best they are. There's nothing better. And it won't get better until either the weather changes or man's management changes. See, the goal of knowledge is to go home and do something different than what we've been doing. See, if we don't like what we see, change to something else. So many times when I go out with the county extension agents, go to a guy's property, they all grab their big Houston Livestock Show belt buckle, and they say, oh, Dr. Ricker, uh, uh, what do you think we're doing wrong here? And I look both ways and say, it beats me. But see, being an educated person, 
I know what to ask that guy. And I look him in the eye and I say, sir, what have you been doing here for the last 50 years that makes this place look the way it does? He tells me about the time it never rained, the time it rained too much, the time the hurricane came in, the hailstorm came in. He plowed over there. He seeded over there. He planted something over here. He burned over there. He built fences over here. He went from small European cattle to large cattle. In the 70s, he integrated, brought in sheep and goats and donkeys, chinchillas, emus, and ostriches. <laughs> And then on top of all that, his wife wanted 20 Welsh ponies <laughs> on top of the, all of his cattle on the land. And see, by the time he tells me what he's been doing, I begin to understand why his place looks the way it does. <laughs> and I look that guy in the eye and I say, sir, until you stop what you're doing, your place will always look the same. See, the goal of knowledge is to change what we're doing if we don't like what we see. So in the Master Naturalist, to learn how to see the land, you got to know the insects. You got to know the soils. You got to know the weather pattern. What amphibians are out there? What mammals? What reptiles? What bats are flying around? Because if you can't name them, you can't see them. They're just green, yellow, purple, black, orange, or red. And until you can name them, you can't go look them up in a book and find out everything that man has written down about it and said, is it good or is it bad? Because, see, even man made that up. If you go back to Genesis, there was a guy getting ready to graduate from high school, 18 years old. He read in Genesis, in, in the third section, it said that God looked at the creation on the sixth day and said everything was good. <laughs> that young man, being so wise and smart, he went up to the preacher and he said, Preacher, I read in Genesis that God looked at the creation on the sixth day and said everything on the earth was good. If that's true, why do we have mosquitoes? Fire ants, ticks, chiggers, Africanized honeybees, mesquite, ratama, weesatch, broomweed, ragweed. The preacher chuckled and said, young man, that's an easy answer. All those things are here to humble man, to remind man that he'll never be God or God-like. See, those things guide us into looking at the change of the land. Well, what was actually here naturally is a little bit fuzzy. We have some ideas, but it was not a sea of grass from one side of the coastal prairie to another. It had holes in it. It had disturbance in it from the hurricanes, the freezes, the thawing, the hot days, the drought, the bison, the antelope, the elk, the bear, the alligators, the beavers that were doing things on the land. They caused change in that land. So, let's look at principle number six that says, in ecological terms, everything must go somewhere. <clears throat> well, where's your garbage going? See, where I live, the Bryan City dump is full. They combined in with the College Station dump eight years ago. Today, that dump is full. They annexed 2,000 acres in the next county and took land away from a man to build the new city dump. When I met with them, I said, when that one's full, where are y'all going next? See, is it the goal that our trash is going to be put in cylinders and sent to the moon for Tijuana City working materials? Are we going to put it in tubes and sink it at the bottom of the ocean? Look at what, look where we're going. The developers want, look at that map. The developers want ranchettes of five and ten acres from Beaumont to El Paso. The cities want places to put our trash. Because, see, we make waste, and we're the largest growing thing in Texas. When man got here, there were 30, it was estimated that were 30 to 70,000 Indians. We had 24 million people in Texas demanding the right to live the American dream. How are we going to pull that off? See, how many of you are conservationists? You know, I won't tell the governor. So let's look at the word conservation. And the word conservation comes from the word conserve. It means to use less or to use what you have out over an extended period of time. If I tell you that on the earth we use more gold, more silver, more lignite, more platinum, more tungsten, more oil, more gas, more uranium, more clean air, more clean water, more timber, more soil than man has ever seen used on the face of the earth last year. What in the world are we conserving? See, it is a global environment. And when you put a brick in the toilet, 
to save water and you cause that sewer system to be blocked up, you will be fine because the developer already knows the amount of water to flush to get the refuse to the city treatment plant. See, planting another tree isn't even going to help. You already have more trees down here than man has ever <coughs> seen down here. And every year, the amount of carbon in the air continues to grow up. And the hill country went from being a grassland to being a cedar live oak thicket. We're growing more trees. And you didn't even have to plant them. They're coming up due to the disturbance and the change caused by man. So what's one more little tree going to do when I understand that to tie up carbon in the air on a daily basis, 80% of that is done in the ocean, not here on the land. This is only 20% of the daily tie-up of carbon out of the air. Question? I just had a question about what you talked about, something being natural. If, if you look at the whole world, everything is, is here is natural. In the beginning, it was natural. It's natural. Mm -hmm. just moved around to different yeah, locations. You're I'm exactly saying. right. So bottom line is, if you eradicate things that are not natural to Texas, would that sustain the area? No, sir. The, you've already lost from 4 to 24 inches of topsoil over the entire state. Texas will never go back to the way it was. So you don't want it to go back. Well, man has to make up his own mind. We don't hire the government to tell us what to do. See, as a democratic society of a republic, we get to make up our own mind on where we're going. That's why we have a class. That's why we do talks. And we, and we go around and tell people the truth. That empowers those people to make up their own mind. Always tell Master Naturalist tongue-in-cheek on everything you hear. Until you prove it to yourself that it's correct, then don't believe it. Because the hearsay, the wives' tales, and the myths abound in the lands of Texas. Well, expand, expand against uh, what I just said earlier. Mesquite. Yeah. Even though it's not natural in this area, it has a lot of value. I, the mesquite-covered lands, actually, the amount of nitrogen and organic carbon being put in the soil, those are the places that the prairie will actually come back the soonest. Because we, we, if you uh, go out and keep killing all the woody plants that are putting carbon back in the soil from the days of farming, you're actually slowing the process down. <clears throat> but see, when I take the blackland prairie that was plowed for 200 years and I let it release it from farming for one year, five year, ten year, up to 60 years, and I compare the seven basic parameters of the soil to unplowed land, how long does it take blackland prairie soils to reach unplowed land? See, the, or, or, the soil organic matter has been reduced to half. <clears throat> the bulk density has been destroyed. The soil aggregate stability has been changed. Those lines through the seven parameters hit 210 years. So what's the next step? To do area? the right thing today so that we get the right if thing we started keep, to go if into we keep the running future. off all this soil, topsoil and all that, what's going to happen way back? That succession that I was talking about a minute ago, that there are places that are being managed correctly today, we now see that much topsoil being reformed on top of clay due to change in management. I thought maybe it was volcanic or something. You know, oh, well, or something just well like we have volcanoes occurring everywhere. There. Uh, underwater in the Pacific especially, there, there are new Hawaiian islands that in just another thousand years are going to finally hit the surface of the ocean. <clears throat> See, change is normal, but in the few things that we do, how do we want to direct that change that we have control over through our stewardship? See, do we want to continue doing what the developers say? Do we want to continue doing what the extremists say? Get all people? You know, I think we ought to pack up everybody in Texas, move them to Arizona, and well, save well. Texas, don't y'all? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Arizona doesn't have enough water to sustain 24 million more people. So what is the limiting element in Texas? The first limiting element is knowledge. The second limiting element is water. See, we, we barely have enough water to water all the people, industries, agriculture that we have right now. See, the next time we get another 10-year drought, it won't be just Haskell, Texas, and Brockmartin, Texas that run out of water. Uh, they told us originally where I lived that we had water 
in the Wilcox Sands, 2,000 feet down, that would carry the current growth in my area to 2050. Last week, they changed it to 2030. Because it, new knowledge and new understanding come about. See? And so, look at seven. Every gain is won at some cost. We find through the principles of ecology, there's no such thing as a free lunch. That means for anything that we will do to improve this land, change this land, you and I will pay for it. Our money, our blood, our sweat, our tears. Because see, the government is not going to come down here and save us. So your federal bailout today is the handouts that I'm giving you. <laughs> so the successful ecosystem manager times his interactions to the right moment, the right place, often becoming somewhat inconspicuous and seemingly unimportant. See, in ecosystem science management, we tweak things, but we allow Mother Nature to do it. See, instead of bringing in the cement, the bulldozers, the rebar, which all get washed out over time anyway. Our engineering does not sustain the land. So, the ecosystems that we define are global, right down to microscopic and what's under one rock. Man determines that. If I'm going to look at the Mississippi uh, eco River ecosystem, I'm going to be looking at 4,833 miles of river. That's a big ecosystem to look at, and tributaries and all kinds of people. So, we have this natural system here on the Katy Prairie and this whole coastal prairie, but our social and political system is wrapped around it. And so, the ecosystem management is primarily about human values, not about natural system values. It's built around what humans think is good and bad and right and wrong. See? But humans are a part of the ecosystem. We don't separate ourselves out. So humans use resources and produce waste. The natural ecosystems are necessary for the resources we need and to detoxify the byproducts, the impacts of use. Healthy ecosystems in large enough quantity and location are necessary to sustain resource production and prevent accumulation of those toxic byproducts. How much of the natural system must be maintained to support our current lifestyle? Well, ladies and gentlemen, nobody really knows the answer to that. But some of the extremists say that around 1970, we passed the point of no return. That every year, things will continue to get worse for man. Because we've done that separation of the land away from what it was doing and we keep partitioning it into smaller and smaller things that are now unrelated to each other. So think about this guy that came to class. He wanted to get out of Houston. He drove out in the country. He went with the realtor and uh, all of a sudden he came up on this 10 acre place for sale and a deer ran through. And butterflies were going on the weeds and dicky birds were playing into branches from the ground up to about six foot. He said, man, that's the place for me. And he bought that 10 acres. He, he bulldozed an area to build the log cabin. He, bull, he did it. And then he sat out on the front porch one day. And he, and he looked around. And it changed. Because right after he built the house, he mowed the whole 10 acres. And then he pruned all the trees up to 8 foot. <laughs> like his house in Houston. And 30 days later, he called me and said, Dr. Rector, I think all my neighbors are killing my wildlife. And I said, well, sir, what have you been doing there? He told me about building a house, mowing the whole place, pruning all the trees up. And I said, you remember where those dicky birds were playing? You don't have those branches anymore. You remember the wildflowers that were supporting the bees, the wasps, the butterflies, and other nectar and pollen-loving insects? They're not there anymore. You remember that deer eat weeds? You mowed them all down. And only then did he begin to realize that what we do in the urban zone is not the same management or tools that we use out on the natural lands. See, but he thought his neighbors were killing all his wildlife. They left his property and went to the neighbors because <laughs> they weren't doing what he was doing. See, and then I reminded him, I said, sir, how many acres does it take to run a white-tailed deer doe? See, he thought when he bought the 10 acres, he's going to manage deer. But the white-tailed deer home range is 80 to 240 acres. And a white-tailed deer buck is around 400 to 800 acres. See, he's going to share a deer. 
<laughs> so he said, well, what, what can I manage out here? And I said, doodle bugs, ant lions, <laughs> grasshoppers, and crickets, because they stay within the 10 acres of your little ecosystem. You see, but not migratory but ducks. So think about what man does and how he understands it. So what's necessary for human survival and a quality of life? There are no natural ecosystems on the earth that have not been impacted by man. The magnitude of human impact varies by ecosystem over space and time. Even at the Arctic and Antarctica have been impacted. We cannot go back to prehistoric times, nor will ecosystems ever recover to their original condition and function because they're changed. Even the earth is constantly changing. We can, within limits, achieve desired future ecosystem condition and function. What should that be? We as the citizens get to make up our mind what that should be. Is that more concrete and asphalt and more runoff and more drainage ditches? Or does that keep the water in the soil on the land when it comes? Because they, what does it take to grow plants? Water. Well, you get the things that grew here grew in the 45-inch rain belt. If I get rid of 15 inches of the water by sending it to the Gulf, now the plants of the 30-inch rain belt will grow here. See, I can get, how do, you, how do you make cacti grow here? You build up a bed with gravel and sand, well-drained, then you can grow plants of the 10 to 15-inch rain belt of West Texas over here where it rains 45. But that's the same thing we're doing out there on the land. Sure. Making things that aren't even native here grow here. We force it to happen. Why, not, why don't you just move to West Texas? <laughs> see, if that's what you want to see. So, we can never do merely one thing. One thing has never solved an ecosystem level problem. There are no, no effects or truly side effects, but you hear it about drugs all the time. After you take this drug, you get a headache, you get dry idea, you diarrhea, have a stomach ache, you'll die. <laughs> but see, on the land, whatever we see happen, it's real. It's not a side effect. It really happens when we see it. So, no system can long survive effects of unopposed negative feedback, or the system and its integrity give way and become something else. <clears throat> Thou shalt not transgress the carrying capacity. When you do, you change and destroy that ecosystem. How many people can we have? How many bears should we have? How many alligators? How many dicky birds? And so, over here at the Galveston Refuge, and uh, over at the Atwater Prairie Chicken Refuge, we always ask the biologists, uh, you got 60 Atwater Prairie Chickens left. How, at what point in the decline of their population did they stop impacting our environment? The biologist said when the population fell below 10,000 birds, the activity of the bird had no more effect. Well, we got 60 left. What do you think they're doing out there? Think they're going to do something in the environment that will save us? See, the biologists don't believe that. So the sanctity of life must give way before the sanctity of the carrying capacity or the whole thing collapses. And so not all elements of the human carrying capacity are expandable because we have our own predators, our own diseases, our own biological control factors like heart attack and cancer and the spread of, of diseases from every country on the <laughs> earth that will wipe us out. Ecosystem management is a management philosophy which focuses on desired conditions rather than system outputs and it recognizes the need to protect or restore critical ecological components. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I hope in the class that's what you're going to be learning about. But to see it changed and that it needs to be worked on, you've got to be able to identify its components. The soils, the weather, the birds, the toads, the snakes because we want to sustain it into the future so that the people after us do have a healthy environment. So the man said, you've got to decide what side of the fence you want to be on. Do you want to take it all and be rich, or do you want to get some money and, and still be there tomorrow? So, let me go through these real quick. I'm watching this clock. And, and look at the area that we live in. 60 inches of rain here, 4 per year here. 180 degrees of growing season here, 365 down here. Texas was known worldwide by 1854 as having the most diverse fauna and flora ever discovered on the face of the earth. But 
Some people said we should have been five states. <laughs> and so look at what, uh, uh, in this Ace Reed cartoon, Jake is up here in the truck looking at his thin cattle eating the last grass out of that prickly pear. There's no grass of the prairie left. But Jake's idea, he says to his buddy in the truck, hey, I wintered mighty good. All my cattle are still standing up. See, but will they, at a two and a half body condition, will they breed back and give him a calf? See, what, we, what is it about land management that we need to know? So people's ideas about what the prairie and grass are, I like this one because here's a guy, and this is over in Washington County, we call that lizard lick because even a lizard can't get their tongue around a blade of grass to eat, and the cow eats with their tongue. When the grass gets below three inches tall, I force that cow to become a sheep and a goat or a deer that eat with their lips, and this animal's body production will go downhill if I force it not to have enough tall grass to eat with its tongue. See, this is destroying and changing that grazing environment. And then we, we bring in these things like the white-tailed deer. The thing I'm not showing you is right over here is a 3,000-pound feed box with 3,000 pounds of feed in because the deer already browsed everything up and already ate all the weeds, and deer don't eat grass. Only about 9% of their diet in the month of February is grass. Deer eat the weeds, the borbs, the legumes, and then they go to browse, but they die with a belly full of grass. It's called hollow belly because deer cannot digest highly cellulitic grass. See, they're a specialized grazer. So when I look at the Gulf prairies and marshes, this is what people mostly think of. The water at the edge of the beach down there, and that every foot the vegetation changes because elevation, and, and, and on these gill guys that Jaime was talking about, you know, two to four inches of elevation change can change the whole plant community on the coastal prairie. Because am I going to be more well drained or am I going to be standing in water? And things like Bermuda grass from Africa don't like to stand in water. So we don't plant much Bermuda grass down here unless it's a well drained sand because Bermuda grass will die standing in six months worth of water. See? And so by the time I get to the top of the sand dune, I have a whole nother plant community. Well, man, in that article I gave you, he's come in and described the vegetation in the soils. <coughs> Different articles, <coughs> authors from Cook to Kohler uh, have described what kind of potential vegetation community is there. But they also described the parallel to the Gulf. Because, see, all the land down here on the Gulf has come from upstream. The rivers have brought the sediments down here, and so we have various depths of soil above the original material that was here, been washed in, blown in. And so even the Brazos River, if you look at a satellite imagery, it's entered the Gulf of Mexico at over 50 different places. That Where it enters in the Gulf today is not where it was entering the Gulf just a thousand years ago. See, it changes. And so what is your vision? of what the coastal prairie should look like. None of the early settlers said, Texas got a weed problem. None of them said, Texas got a brush problem. See, those changes are in the era of our time, whether we can see it or not. But the bison roamed around. There were no fences. They would not come back to the same place to graze, but once a year or once every 10 years. See, under livestock management, we can rotate but they're always on the same piece of land. So we got to be wise about how we handle that. And th there was openings from fire and bison on this land that made habitat for the prairie chicken. Fish and Wildlife Service has a hard time keeping these booming grounds open through current technology that, that because we don't have the things that were natural. The marshes, if we don't have erosion and, and fertilizer coming off of the land, into the Gulf freshwater marshes, then the shrimp and oyster industries will die. If we build more lakes up in the land for man, and we don't allow the correct amount of nutrients and water to come in here, you can forget eating oysters and shrimp in the future. See, that's the changes that we bring about. So let's go to one more thing that I want to cover before I let you go to eat lunch, because Jaime has got a, a big plan for you after lunch. But this is a 1952 picture in Brazoria County. 
and look at the number of trees that are already there. How, how come we have 800-year-old live oak trees still today on the coastal prairie? Because the frequency of fire is not an average. Remember the average? You get 45 inches of rain. Well, you're either above the average or below the average. The average has never occurred. I wish the weathermen would quit talking about it at night because its <laughs> average is 45, and last night we were 38. And he said, well, global cooling is coming back. <laughs> but the average has never occurred. You're always going to be higher or lower than any average. Why well, live by the average? It never has happened. So, but, but look at that land in 1952. Look at this land over in Chambers County in Anahuac, and where are the trees in it? Where are the rice fields? See, where are the things that have created the change? And then this is down at Kennedy County, but this is actually non-native grass, and this is a root plow line. But I could have tricked you into believing that the grassland went right up to that line, couldn't I? <laughs> See, it's just not true. Things are integrated in and out. The forests of Missouri move e west, and then over another eon of time, the grasslands move east. It changes constantly in, in what we see. And then we have great impact on those estuaries by what we do. So look at this. Uh, let me get so Here is an example of change. Aerial photograph. Aerial photograph. Looking at the Houston Chip Channel. And today, recreation is the thing that's leading the way on what we're using that land for. But where's that prairie? See, where, where's the prairie out here? We're still maintaining this as farmland because isn't there a compromise that to be here tomorrow, we've also got to eat, and we need to be producing 24 million people's worth of food every day because Chile just had a, you know what, earthquake, and we're getting 60% of our fresh produce at HEB comes from Chile. I wonder why the airplanes aren't flying and there won't be any new cherries, there won't be any new grapes. The people over in your valley, their lettuce grows. See, where are you going to eat tomorrow? Better be learning how to can goods, store food, get ready for Y2K again, and have rabbits growing in your backyard. <laughs> so this is the Army Bayou Nature Center, and we maintain it as a prairie by burning it every other year. And then these dead plants are the Chinese tallow trees, and these are the live Chinese tallow trees that are 30 years old. But the, the Chinese tallow tree changes the soil, chelates out the elements in the soil, and the prairie cannot compete with that. So under a Chinese tallow tree, the prairie does not come back very fast. Because the tannic acid out of the tree keeps saturating that soil and transforming that soil. So why are some plants, so look, here's a winter burn, and it didn't kill any of the trees in Ormond Bayou. It burned up all the grass, but now it came back, grew back, but it burned the bottom of the trees, but it didn't kill the trees. So the frequency of fire has a lot to do with what survives on a piece of land. And here's part of the coastal prairie. This is Sacoista bear grass, or Gulf cord grass, down by Refurio, in a little inlet coming up from the coast. So we have the things like big blue stem, big panicum, uh, uh, yellow Indian grass, and little blue stem. But then we have a mixture of things like water hyacinth that are out on the land that are not native. And, and so how can these things outcompete that? See, what does it take? The prairie was resilient. But there are certain ways we push it that we can't solve it without bringing in the large equipment. The spider lily down in the bayous. So look at the frequency of fire, and I'm going to give you a handout on this, uh, that here in the coastal prairie, notice the white line, is that the short grass prairie here in the coastal prairie and the climber prairie up here around Dallas and Fort Worth burn naturally here for one to three years. That helped make it look the way it did when we got here. How, when's the last time you saw the area around where you live burn? <laughs> that no wonder all the woody plants, the vines, the poison ivy, the grapevines, the green briars are taking over your land because what used to keep them at bay is no longer there. One of the things that's changed is the frequency of fire. So no part of Texas was not in a fire regime un over 25 years. Even the piney woods burned once every 25 years. But big trees with no fuel on, under them, they didn't burn. And, and that's the kind of environment we're producing here, is that there's a lot of area here that would not burn because look at, look at this picture at Rosenberg. 
This is ryegrass from Italy. It's green in the wintertime. You planted it to make your lawn green. Then it escaped in the culvert. Then it went out in the guy's pasture. Now it's into the forest. Now it's on the rangeland. It's not native. But now we can't burn because there's no dry fuel for a winter burn. See, we change the land. We can't even use some of the tools. So look at this area. Guy threw a cigarette out, burned the Johnson grass. The fire went through the fence and over the hill. Look at these trees right there. The Waco Tribune said, land destroyed. <laughs> I took the lady out there, showed her every rock was still there. The fence was still there. The crowns of the plants were still there. All the soil was still there. She wouldn't believe me. Took, that's August, took her back on November the 3rd, and after a fall rain, the grass started coming back up. But these ash junipers here are dead because they're not fire tolerant. They've only increased in the hill country and on the black land print because we have no fire. Eastern red cedar is a junk plant like these. It is a weed. Okay, so here it is. We got rain, the grass started coming back, but look what Mother Nature responds. Because on the same place, here it is in April. Who came up? The Texas blue bonnets, the Lenheimer daisy, and the grass is continuing to grow. No seed nor organism was destroyed in the soil when this prairie burned. Because the fire moved at five miles an hour and only heated the soil surface up one degree Fahrenheit. Now, let's look at that's April. Let's look at it in May. Now, those things left the growing cycle. Showy evening primrose, Indian blanket, uh, some other type of perennials came up. But look, the prairie's coming back. All the fire did was set it into a new condition, and then here it is in June. And now all the purple is horse mint and bee balm. So look at the procession of plants we've gone through in three months. The land is constantly changing. But things like blue bonnets come up as disturbance plants, weeds, to save the soil. If you're growing blue bonnets at the expense of your grass, you're destroying Texas. <laughs> that is a weed and only came up after the bison grazed it into the ground or a fire swept the country. These annuals only came up when a disturbance hit the land. So look, here it is in August. Uh, in August. Now it's got common broomweed on it. Do you see land destroyed? No. You see land changed. And here it is in December, 15 months after the original fire. See, we set other things into action due to the factor of disturbance that is always present on the land. So look, here's what the prairie looked like. Not one wildflower in that picture is an annual. The larkspurs are perennials. The sundews, the Enothera, Triloba, and Cerulata are perennials. These real Indian paintbrushes of every color under the rainbow are perennials. Your Indian blanket, your Coreopsis, your blue bonnets, your Texas paintbrush are junk. <laughs> Do you get it? See, the, only the perennials could compete with grass and grow in the same year under the same conditions. See, the others are disturbance recovery plants. So if you grow blue bonnets every year, ladies and gentlemen, you ate all your grass. This was the coastal prairie, a prairie of a sea of grass. So do the right thing. Make the right decisions. Then you can get a publication from Texas Parks and Wildlife and Texas A&M University on how to do it right. But see, you have to make the decision first. So what is our goal? Our goal is to get knowledge and an understanding about the system that we live in. See, that understanding. And until I can name these organisms on the land, how do I know that current management is doing the right thing or not doing the right thing? So we learn every ology in the Texas Master Natural Program. So you'll become a bat lady. You'll become the plant man. You'll know everything about weather. You'll know alligators. See, everyone in the course 
has something that they can be the best on without having to know everything. But we work together as a group. Your class will do lots of things together, and then you'll integrate with the other trained naturalist in the chapter to work on various projects. But will the projects we do be worth it, or will they just be piddling in the wind? <laughs> See, think about it. What is worth your time, your money, your resources to make happen? Don't be hoodwinked by the Internet and the media. Learn the truth about the land. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to stand right here, Jaime, until you come up and fix it and secure it. Yeah, okay. There you go. There you go. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Now, I've got uh, another handout or appraisal uh, of your.